probably she was preparing and couldn't join. And it's a pity because uh, it would be a good contribution in terms of um, her studies in animals. So, yeah. And she's a very good comrade of mine. Oksana is very sweet, extremely okay. generous person. Thank you. That is in animals. So, yeah. Why do I hear my voice? Um, is it probably what? the stream going from somewhere? But I guess yeah. it's okay right now. Okay. Okay. So we'll be starting now. And yeah, hello all, and uh, welcome to the. Uh, fourth episode of the third season of Shelter in Places. Um, my name is Nikita Nichev and I study at the new Center and Research Creator for Grosh Digital, a program for supporting artists and researchers working with emerging technology and media at Grosh Museum of Contemporary Art Moscow. And I will be moderating today's talk, which I'm actually overly excited about. And firstly, I would like to introduce today's amazing guests, Katy Chukhrov and Rizina Guristani. So Katy Chukhrov is an associate professor at the Department of Cultural Studies at the National Research University High School of Economics. In 2012-2017, she has been the head of theory and research department at the National Center of Contemporary Art Moscow. Chukhrov has authored numerous texts on art theory, culture, politics, and philosophy. Her postdoctoral dissertation dealt with the anthropology and ontology of performativity, and her full-length books include To Be to Perform, Theatre in Philosophic Critique of Art, uh, and Bound, and a volume of dramatic writing, Just Humans. Her present research interests are, uh, and publications deal with, firstly, the impact of Soviet economy on the ethical epistemes of historical socialism, with uh, performance studies and with neo-humanism in the conditions of post-human theories. Uh, Rizina Guristani is a philosopher. He has contributed extensively to journals and anthologies and lectured at numerous international universities and institutes. His current philosophical project is focused on rationalist universalism, beginning with the evolution of the modern system of knowledge and advancing toward contemporary philosophies of rationalism, their procedures, as well as their demands for special forms of human conduct. He is the author of Cyclonopedia and Intelligence and Spirit. Um, so for today's um, talk, I've proposed uh, a topic uh, which uh, sounded uh, the mystery of black boxes. Um, and um, uh, uh, so in her recent text on the philosophical disability of reason, uh, Katy Chukhrov reminds us of a short science fiction piece, The Mystery of Black Box, written in the 60s by the Soviet philosopher Avril Dilinkov, uh, in which the author contemplates the future role of autopoetic behavior of AI and its application. The story depicts a dystopian world inhabited with machines producing algorithmic infinities as the consequence of an essentialist obsession with computation and algorithmic logic. Inside of such a scenario that Ilinkov as a representative of Marxist humanities firstly conceived of has recently re-emerged in relation to the application of biotechnical and computational sciences in the humanities. And today I propose to discuss the current paths and developments in algorithmic modes of knowledge production following Ilinkov's vision in order to outline the potentialities and limitations of human reason under conditions of its machinic self-evaluation. Of particular interest will be the kinds of uh, emancipatory social and communicative prospects that may emerge as a result of such ontogenesiological transformations. Um, so that's going to be a kind of a general framework for uh, the talk and probably the first and pretty general and naive question um, that I have in mind to kick off uh, was to think about that while well, talking about human reason and knowledge production, as well as the possibilities of the introduction of non-human alien and AGI-like uh, reasoning. The first question that emerges is uh, how we actually think of human reason in mind and at least what paradigms should be used or could be used to describe it. Um, um, I know who would like to go first, yeah. Um, I don't know, what do you suggest? Uh, I think that, please, you can start. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, first of all, for invitation, Nikita. Uh, and uh, I'm really delighted to be invited uh, as an interlocutor 
um, to a new center of research and practice because I really admire uh, what you are doing in terms of um, uh, philosophic research and artistic research. Um, and uh, I've been reading the works of Riza for years on end, uh, and I more or less know his re research. Uh, so it was very interesting for me to make the comparisons uh, of the critique of um, neural networks and artificial intelligence that we have in Marxist and post-Marxist um, theory uh, and in contemporary debate about um, artificial intelligences and well, just before I start answering your question about uh, human reason, I maybe uh, would delineate um, uh, very shortly some kind of um, principal paradigms um, of, of how um, uh, the critique of artificial intelligence develops uh, or what I am observing so far. Uh, so on the one hand, we have a bioessentialist cybernetic trend, which is translating the biological neural systems and abstracting them into cybernetic um, languages uh, and cybernetic coding. And uh, I think classical cybernetic belongs to this context. We have... Um, uh, language philosophic tradition, which Riza represents. Then we have uh, Luciana Parisi and Yuk Hui who try to rely on creative cosmotechnics and prove that um, artificial intelligence is not about rationality, but it is completely uh, creative, uh, full of ruptures, incomputabilities, uh, and indeterminacies. And in this way, they try to somehow shift from uh, the accusations of um, um, artificial intelligence uh, in some kind of uh, positivist, uh, nominalist um, um, uh, uh, essentialism. And um, I think Ilyenkov that we are discussing today uh, to, to whom I more or less dedicated this text uh, titled On the Disability of the Philosophic Reason probably belongs to, um, to the critical uh, tradition of the analysis of philosophic potentialities of technology. And I think if we try to somehow um, pick up um, the critics who also deal with this issue. I could mention here perhaps um, the recent text by Matteo Pasquinelli and his uh, No Scope, uh, Manifesto of No Scope. Perhaps he goes into this tradition which tries to uh, socialize the issues um, of uh, artificial intelligence and neural networks. And now I start um, answering the question. Well, the question was, what is human reason, right? Um, uh, it means that we should um, decide through which, via which parameters to, uh, to define human reason. And um, I think uh, if we rely on uh, um, Ilyenkov's uh, attitude, uh, the most important thing here is how he treats um, Hegel and whole, tr whole tradition of the philosophic idealism um, in which the issues of reason are first and foremost not the categories of intelligence and not so much the categories of uh, cognition solely but first and foremost of um, ethical attitude and of uh, um, certain reliance uh, on what happens in labor, sociality, and um, uh, the possibility of the human subject for self-resignation. 
And these are really very important issues. Um, Self-resignation, uh, labor and sociality, because um, uh, as far as I know, uh, for Riza, in his brilliant book, Intelligence and Spirit, the principal um, concept to uh, construct and build his uh, theory of reason is language and linguistic categories by means of which you can build the, the whole broad scale of codes and um, significations for artificially reconstructing uh, the intelligence. But um, uh, uh, what is important here in, in defining human reason is that for Ilyenko, for instance, uh, neither language nor reason nor any thinking capacity is possible without the stage of labor. So um, I would say that uh, probably uh, instead of um, positing Geist and instead of positing reason and spirituality on the language, um, uh, Ilyenkov would first and foremost posit thinking and reason on the outwardness of the objecthood. And this is very important because this would mean that thinking is not in brain. And of course, Riza would agree with it. And Riza is great in proving that um, it is really wrong to situate and locate reason in brain as some cognitivists do. But at the same time, what Ilyenko would have uh, in his special attitude is that the forms of things are also nominal objects. So the thinking procedure is not um, confined to linguistic propositions, but it is also um, located in the outwardness of externalized speciality and is entangled in objecthood. And this externalized nature of reason and externalized uh, nature of thought meant for Ilyenkov that thinking is not internal process, but it is the result of external action exerted on objects and things. And that's why biased and grounded uh, in external bodies and their in interrelations, the principal uh, parameter for which is labor. Well, I would uh, stop here and uh, maybe um, uh, Riza would uh, comment. Um, uh, many thanks, uh, ex excellent, excellent remarks. Uh, uh, I think the, the question uh, that Nikita asked is quite difficult, uh, but this difficulty is not um, that in its essence is a difficult question. It's precisely difficult to the extent that um, beneath its surface, uh, there, are, uh, there are fundamental distinctions um, as what sociality means, what the reason means, as you pointed out, so on and so forth. To the extent that um, I think that these these are, I don't want, uh, like Karnap said, that these are pseudo problems, such questions, but I would say that all such questions should be taken with a grain of salt, um, uh, precisely because um, it is extremely easy to, for example, um, Allied the distinction between sociality of conceptual activities that emerge from language mm -hmm. and sociality of uh, material, uh, uh, basically uh, processes, right? Uh, labor relations, social relations of the kind of a Marxist uh, uh, historical materialist uh, uh, will think. Or for example, other kinds of sociality like sociality of communication, which again, is a, is a different notion of sociality. I mean, the kind of socialities that we are talking about with regard to the ideas of 
reason, they need to be uh, basically um, distinguished clearly. I understand that the, the distinction itself cannot be uh, fine grained because of the entangled nature of these hierarchies of sociality or definitions of sociality or whatever we, we call them. Um, but we have to uh, strive to do what Plato asked us to do, cut at the joints, such that we don't splinter the bones. Um, I completely agree that um, the nature uh, that that social uh, sociality, in the sense of certain kind of labor relations or material processes. Um, play an important, not even important, a, a central pro probably from, from, from that specific perspective, that specific level of sociality, play a central role in uh, what you might call to be the machination of reason or human reason. But then, then second thing happens here. Uh, so not only we have a different levels or definitions or what you might call to be dimensions of sociality, but also we have uh, what you might, we might call to be distinction between different, different, uh, different definitions or levels of what counts as a reason, at what level, right? So I think that um, obviously intelligence and spirit is, doesn't try to uh, be super ambitious with regard to saying that um, talking about all of the uh, all of these uh, levels or hierarchies of sociality or distinctions it only tries to focus its scope on a very a specific problem language as a design of geist right mm -hmm. language by that i do not mean lang linguistic proposition in the sense that we have it but that the essence of language itself, there is mm -hmm. something in it that that logical, that the logical essence of language that uh, enables enables um, uh, uh, the path for what we might call uh, to be uh, an apperceptive agent in a Kantian sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is what you might we might call it to be um, um, the. It, a kind of a germ, a kind of uh, um, embryo uh, for the concept of intelligence, precisely because at this level, uh, we can talk about intelligence, not in the sense that people at Les Wrong talk about intelligence, right? In this free floating idea of intelligence, but intelligence essentially cons being constrained by what counts as intelligible in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's what concepts are in, interesting. But of course, the sociality that goes to and can be defined, uh, can be attached to the con con these conceptual activities, namely the logical infrastructure of language, is not the sociality that Habermas talks about, like communicative rationality, or the sociality that Marx talks about. Essentially, it doesn't mean that it's separate from them. I mean, it, it's, uh, it is com disconnected, it's disconnected from them. It simply means that we need to kind of bracket the problem of the sociality of language to its own mechanisms, its own characteristics in order for, for us to talk clearly about other forms of sociality, other levels of sociality, such as labor relations, such as, for example, you know, uh, what you might call to be uh, even um, um, the, the historical materialist criticism of human rationality, right? So on and so forth. Uh, okay, great. Um, then um, may I comment to this, Nikita? The moderator is allowing yeah, me. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, so <laughs> uh, well, I, I wanted to 
list um, those uh, things really uh, that I really find uh, very important in your attitude and in your book, and then ask you a question how to deal with certain issues that are incomprehensible for me in terms of dealing precisely what you said. How can, how can we abstract those languages and whether we are having that, um, mm, that right in terms of um, uh, tearing uh, the linguistic parameters from the materiality. So what I find really uh, important in your book that um, you rely on uh, not simply phenomenological consciousness, but you map the semiology of the self-consciousness. This I find extremely important. Um, and uh, that you make differentiation between different kinds of functionalism and your functionalism and your description of how you deal uh, with function is not flat functionalism, but you call it constrained functionalism. functionalism. This I also find extremely uh, important. Also uh, th that you somehow uh, try to step out from this uh, obsessive biologically um, tinted um, uh, cybernetic uh, contexts like Metzinger and other co cognitivists. Uh, and uh, this is extremely important. But um, my question would be, and my question not only to you personally, but generally to to this optimistic attitude that we can list the functions to really um, somehow um, write the program of of the in of what is intelligible in intelligence. Um, well, first of all, um, uh, my question is whether thought uh, would be then completely predictable in terms of uh, somehow reconstructing its chains in terms of programmatic uh, algorithmization. This is first question. Second question that I also don't understand, when we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and its semiological parameters, we have here patterns, we have here recursivities, uh, we have um, uh, um, certain sorts of um, um, uh, specific uh, semiological uh, uh, statistical approximations. And first and foremost, the, um, the semiology of recognition, which is very important. So do we deal with linguistic or mathematical parameters when we deal with the algorithmic and uh, computing essences and computing, com computing coding the data and algorithmization? So are the data and algorithmization linguistic at all or mathematical or, at all? Or we deal with certain kind of different uh, praxis? Um, uh, this is uh, one issue which uh, makes me feel certain sort of reservation of um, uh, so courageously using the language when we talk about... May, uh, may yeah. I just uh, short, uh, be before I forget, before I forget yes, some sure, of the points sure. that you made. Uh, yes, um, I think this is this is the thing. I would I wouldn't call. Uh, you see, when as I said, when I said bracketing, I don't mean that we are abstracting it. No. But that obviously, any sort of research uh, into the function of language should start with actually what language, what counts as a language, right? How mm -hmm. how how a linguistic uh, agent uh, uh, basically becomes a linguistic agent what it takes for it to be a linguistic agent, but more importantly, what is the consequences? So what are the consequences of having and using a language, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, 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 the, that's what I'm really interested in. Obviously, otherwise we could, we could talk about, for example, an evolutionary 
uh, like Daniel Dennett, a very parochially evolutionary uh, a story of language, right? Where basically we try to say that, well, you know, this kinds of logics, uh, it didn't came out of nowhere. It was just, you know, uh, basically it's a fruit of a series of uh, natural evolutionary processes or what Daniel, uh, Daniel Dennett says, algorithms, right? This is not a story that I'm interested in. It's just another sort of parochialism, meaning that we are trying to relegate the function of language uh, in terms of its own specific sociality to mm -hmm. another lower level, either labor, material, natural processes, so on and so forth, right? That's, that's I think that, that that risks again flat functionalism. Um, so we start with, with, with this simple thing and the why is that, where's the choice of using this, using the, so, this specific sociality of language? Why in fact actually it starts with language? It's not because it is important. It's because that's the only way that we can ever talk about anything. Yes, uh, I, well, on the one hand, I completely agree with you, and I think that how you uh, how you stratify it is is absolutely virtuoso way to do it. Um, and nevertheless, uh, I want to ask myself and ask you, and generally put this question on table: uh, What happens with different understandings of language? Right, so. Mm, um, you bring this Carnapian. Uh, uh, but isn't it the different understanding of languages uh, are well, not really different understanding unless and until they basically account for the logical function of language? Yes. A, which is the essence of language itself. Yes. And but of course, that, that basically becomes, uh, you know, the, the, the very platform that we can, uh, or, 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 the, or the, what a, a friend of mine, Peter Wolf, and they'll uh, talked about it, the language as the killer app of agency, the killer app, where basically you can plug other sorts of plugins, other apps, including other kinds of concepts, other kinds of concerns into the language. That's what makes it killer app. Uh, it's not as if um, that, um, it is the end game of intelligence. Language is not the end game of intelligence. Language is simply what we might call to be an aperture through which we can systematically begin mm -hmm. to talk about what counts as an intelligent agency or as, an, as intelligence. Precisely because everything that we ever talk about, even when we are talking about objects, about a fly, a sentient bee, so on and so forth, is always in analogy with to the resources, conceptual resources that we are using, namely theoretical and practi practical reasonings afforded by natural or formal languages. Otherwise, um, if we think that when we are talking about, you know, uh, the navigation of a, of a bee toward a, wa uh, uh, toward a wasp uh, or uh, a bee in the environment, to the nest or toward an orchid, these are all in analogy to the way that we talk. And that form of talking, that form is a structured mm -hmm. by the logical, uh, what you might call framework or infrastructure of language, conceptual activities par excellence. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with that. And it, the bee and the or orchid or orchid is a good example also. Um, and this is also Deleuzian uh, rhythmatic example. 
um, which is also semiology, right? But um, well, what would happen if in language we want to organize certain kind of crash of, of the meaning or crash and failure of the meaning? For instance, when we talk about uh, absurd, absurdity uh, in poetry, or when we talk about, as Groys says, that the really sovereign uh, thinking procedure would be like total dysfunction like total stepping out of, of the function to suspend the function, for instance. Well, it, it's a little bit anarchic, uh, but <laughs> very characteristic, for instance, for avant-garde artistic um, practices, which always wanted to disrupt uh, functionality. And I think that if you come to history of philosophy, you have this disruption of functionality in the critique of metaphysics, not necessarily the uh, critique of metaphysics as we have in analytical philosophy, but, but much earlier, starting with Nietzsche. And uh, uh, there uh, you, you have a very specific critique of, uh, of, of language and linguistic rationality, which then finds it cli its climax in post-structuralism, where language is somehow cast away, discarded and dismissed in favor of certain affective practices um, or affective uh, experiences. Uh, but I don't agree with this attitude as well. You know what happened in, in post-structuralism where language is the ideology, right? So this post-Althusserian um, uh, tendency shows us language uh, and, and post-psychoanalytic tendency shows us language as, as the constant suppression and repression uh, dealing with which we have to emancipate the body and all other non-linguistic categories. You know this big myth. Yes. And don't you think that this is precisely because that there is in fact eliding the distinction problem of, of the sociality, what kind of sociality language has. A sociality, the sociality that is only and only is specific to its own, uh, what you might call uh, to be core functions. Functions, not in the sense of functionality or purpose, but mm -hmm. what defines a language? Like what is actually the core of language? Um, <laughs> You see, and that's that's actually that's a, that's actually quite a scary uh, thing. And you see that romanticist uh, philosophers uh, in the nineteenth century uh, thought that this is one of the most dangerous questions against Hegel, because uh, uh, because that uh, leads to certain kinds of unwanted consequences in philosophy. And of course, Wittgenstein and other people started to use this. Um, um, the, so, so the romanticists said that, okay, let's talk about this. That the essence of language is ineffable, meaning just try block this whole idea that language has a core function. Let's say that it's just withdrawn from us, withdrawn mm -hmm. from us and never talk about it. Mm -hmm. right? But of course, then we saw that it created a certain kind of extremely parochial philosophy particularly in certain kind of German circles within this new ineffable philosophy of language. Uh, for example, can you list the examples? Um, um, who's that? Um, the, um, uh, that's, um, the one who's, uh, who has written the philosophy of uh, biology. I always, uh, it's not Klassen, Klagen. Is it Klagen? Yes, I think it's Klagen. Okay. Um, uh, one second. Um, Mm -hmm. I always forget his name. Uh, Klagen. Um, Ludwig, Ludwig, I think it's Ludwig Klagen. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, huh? I think so. Yes. So, so there are these, these people, I mean, and they, they were really giants and they exerted huge amounts of influence on the philosophical scene. Um, but I think this again comes back to the idea that um, philosophy tends, um, this is its bane and bliss, curse and bliss at the same time. 
tries to um, do the exact opposite that Plato asked us to. Meaning that they try to actually have a lot of joints without clearly distinguishing with one another, which sometimes is good from the perspective that you were talking about. Like the idea of unconsciousness with regard to the function of language, right? But then precisely because you philosophers sometimes avoid the, the hard task of cutting at the joints, that's what we might call to be creative essence of philosophy turns into organ of pure whimsicality. <laughs> whimsicality, good. <laughs> okay. <gasps> okay, but um, I, I would like to mention one example. You also have this chapter about uh, teaching the toy intelligence, right? You, you use right, right. the game, game metaphor and the toy. And you know that it is, it is actually a, a plagiarized version of a Russian sci-fi book. Yes, I, I, I had this uh, uh, it's self discovery. Uh, who's the. Um... And the pictures are also a little bit reminiscent of some. some right, <laughs> right. This, this, this is. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's. Um, I have. Um, it's, a, it's a book called uh, The Discovery of Self. The Discovery of Self. Is it? The Discovery, yes. The discovery mm -hmm. of self. Um, it's it's essentially uh, um, so. I think that there is actually a footnote about this in the book as well. Uh, so there is this scene in Russia. Um, it starts from early seventies to early eighties, where cyberneticians, German ideal with German idealist upbringing, communist agendas, and uh, sci uh, basically. Have also, um, you know, sci-fi, um, what you might call to be um, mentality. They start to work around these kinds of projects, like uh, kind of gluing, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile mm -hmm. to Kant, to Marx, to Hegel, uh, to Witkowski. Yes, uh, and and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, I, I I was precisely going to mention Vygotsky and the people around him because uh, they also mentioned this uh, uh, example of how to teach uh, the deaf and blind children. So they are also um, infants, uh, and imagine that these infants are as well blind and deaf. So how to inscribe into them the capacity to to use language and yes that's no, no these are really the language be so 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 the whole vygotsky and psychology was afterwards developing into this kind of pedagogy which brought to a very interesting book by alexei leontsev activity and consciousness and uh, uh, what, is, what is it called? Activity and Consciousness? It's called Activity and Consciousness. Uh, and the uh, author is Alexei Leontiev. I can uh -huh. put it into ch Superb. chat. Superb, excellent. And uh, what is important here is that, um, uh, like, I agree with you that the language is the most generalized, the most logical, um, the most uplifted uh, stage uh, of what happens and, and, and how thinking develops. But uh, what they claim is that uh, production of notion, production of concept, production of the ideal issues or the universal or the general issues happens much earlier than the language. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So yes. Already the objecthood, like when the deaf and blind child is trying to perceive the object and um, manually with one's uh, hand uh, by means of haptic procedure touch the objects and uh, try to understand the meaning of this and translate it into semantic uh, parameters, then you already 
have um, the completely, known... Completely, I com yes. in complete they, agreement they, here. Yes, so you already have the nomen. So, and the idea was that the language comes after this nomen, and but it is not the demiurg of, uh, as, as you said, so it's not the demiurg of a meaning. Meaning, uh, yes. Uh, but what is, uh, what is concealed behind linguistic meanings is already... Uh, no, no. I think that there is a, there is a sentence in either the first chapter or the second chapter of Intelligence and a Spirit, where I say that it, it, the majority of the, our concepts, uh, actually the majority of all concepts, um, originate from proto-semantic activities, proto-semantic or pre-semantic mm -hmm. activities. Mm -hmm. And what concepts do simply disambiguate those activities. Mm. Like, for example, uh, the whole idea of the Kanzi, uh, the, the, the monkey, uh, uh, basically uh, the monkey touching the obelisk and Kanzi sees it and mm -hmm. uh, um, starts to create a certain kind of, uh, you know, world proto image, world proto image. And this world proto image is pre linguistic. Uh, and, but, but the thing is that he needs. Uh, those uh, basically semantically loaded concepts in order to disambiguate what he was doing all along. Yes, but uh, the, uh, the discrepancy the discrepancy between Vygotskyan attitude and your attitude starts on the next level. So, okay, we agree that certain kind of uh, non-linguistic activity are already conceptual which you agree with, but then... Not that they are conceptual, but no, 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 they are actually, they are pre-conceptual. Concept simply, basically, is just like the icing on the cake. Simply disambiguation. There are points of disambiguation of what we have already been doing. Yes, I understand. This is your attitude. But what uh, Vygotsky says that uh, uh, the, the transition between the thing and the concept is much shorter in terms of like um, the concept exists before the language and the language is not uh, enhancing it at all, but it is simply mediation. So it is simply the mediation of the already achieved and acquired uh, and uh, um, prepared um, concept. So, so the issue is that the objecthood is already in certain sort conceptual and ideal, and language is lower than the conceptuality of objecthood. So this is the crazy, fantastic idea of uh, all those uh, socialist Marxists, because right, they, right. And, they wanted and yes, to I completely. I think that you are you nailed yeah. the, the, the my problem with you know yeah. even though I love it, Kotsky, but uh, the, the the problem here is that you know uh, it's essentially uh, um, precisely creates uh, an uh, a sort, certain kind of epistemic blockage here. This, this okay. certain kind of attitude. The, 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 my problem with it is that. If the concept, uh, if if we can even talk about concepts as preceding language, then let's think about that an agent has only such concepts that precede the emergence of language. And but what are they? But what uh, are they? What are they? And how do they function? Right. And the thing is that if we don't have the inferential web. Mm. That can only be attained in the full in full force by language. We can never actually associate concepts together, only a sets of a specific concepts, but not all concepts together. Second of all, what is most important, we can no longer have a critical attitude toward the concepts we use, which means that if we only had concepts or proto-concepts preceding the emergence of language, we could never actually ever adopt a critical attitude toward the kind of concepts that we are using, which we you do, are, in fact. You are absolutely right. The issue here is not to uh, somehow freeze on the stage when you are uh, 
providing certain concepts without applying language. But the, um, the idea is to keep the language completely and constantly glued to materiality. Because uh, if labor is already ideal and conceptual, for instance, um, they use this example like the deaf and blind child is learning to eat and is holding the spoon. And the spoon is already not only just stupid uh, object, but it's already a nominal object, which is learning by which the child is teaching and which is already a cultural object. But uh, by this token, what, uh, what is the consequence to this procedure and ling linguistic outcomes of this procedure are constantly connected uh, and they, they are tied with the umbilical cord to materiality and, and to labor procedures. That's why you cannot pull, put uh, uh, and somehow cut off the linguistic procedures and uh, um, labor. We can never do that. Practices. Yes, absolutely. We can never do that. But yeah. what well, is this, important this was, thing... This was the point that I... Uh, yes, no, 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 absolutely. I, uh, no, I agree. We cannot do that. But I would say that this is precisely the problem that the uh, my project in a very uh, larval manner Mm -hmm. I've been trying to address, and by larval, I mean I wanted to say that uh, intelligence and spirit is not actually a book of philosophy. It's just a it's just a groundwork, philosophical work, in the sense that all groundworks are merely made of crap and water, right? They are just mm -hmm. they're just like this. Essentially, you are you are basically. My apologies to use this word. You are uh, shoveling a lot of shit in order to. Uh, distill some good insights out of this. And the same, uh, the same thing I think about uh, intelligence and spirit, that um, basically the question that we are, um, the question that intelligence we tries to begin with is a most minimal form of self-consciousness, not consciousness, but philosophical self-consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And actually self-consciousness is, I would say that is equal to the word philosophy in the way that I have been trying to talk about it. Uh, so self-consciousness. And this self-consciousness should begin from a very sort of abstract core, right? An abstract core is, is language. But then for, for this becomes concrete and practical, then it ought to be take into account labor relations, modes of productions, uh, modes of uh, what you might call to be, um, I, I don't like this word too much, uh, modes of creativity and thinking, so on and so forth. But that's a different story. Um, we have to start from uh, somewhere rather than assuming that we have the knowledge of the totality of the self, practical self-consciousness. We have to assume that this is the lowest form of self-consciousness. And now let's build upon it. Let's think about it coherently, see what it allows us, what it prevents us to do, so on and so forth. That is the, essentially the journey of true intelligence in the sense of uh, practical uh, self-consciousness becomes a matter of practical achievement rather than theoretical ruminations. So okay, does, does, the, uh, does the idea of uh, machinic intelligence, artificial intelligence play any kind of role or could play any kind of role in the revisability of the concept of intelligence um, at all? I would say that the revisability of the concept of human, I, I said this on Twitter once and people started to say that, oh, Reza only is, cares about philosophy of mind and humans, not AGI. I said that the only thing that actually excites me about the idea of AGI or computers is because that they show us what human is, is not, or can become, right? Three different options. The thing is that uh, they said that, well, uh, someone said that, well, AGI um, also thinks about human like that. That's just, that, that's complete misunderstanding of the statement that I had made. 
Meaning what I wanted to say and, uh, was that essentially, if there is a true AGI ever going to be created, it would be human, not a species, a biological species human, but it would be human by definition, right? Sapiens, sapiens, right? Sapiens, and, and that the whole idea is that this, I think that this dichotomy uh, between um, AGI and human is wrong. If the essence of the concept of human is, is its revisability, AGI actually is a name for that revisability. And this is why I said that the outside of view of ourselves as AGI in the book, outside view of ourselves as AGI. I like the idea that, uh, well, the intelligence is already an artificial construction and it is a good opportunity to look at, at the human mind as AGI and AGI is human. I completely agree. And what is interesting as against post-human studies in uh, your uh, approach, Riza, is that um, uh, you try to see, uh, you try to uh, inspect what AGI is starting with the ancient philosophy, right? And uh, you are showing how this artifici artificiality is concocted and uh, functioning. And, and this is really very important and valuable. Uh, but you know, for me, there are questions which are not easily to resolve, uh, not easy to resolve. For example, um, how to combine, for instance, dialectical procedure, this, uh, the issue of Andersein of Hegel and the concept of Andersein, the other self, the non-self, which is constantly um, present in Hegelian dialectics and then in Marxist dialectics and then in post-Marxist dialectics with the functionality and its discreteness. And uh, with this idea that mind uh, and uh, intelligence is simply about augmentation or, or about expansion or about learning or about expansion of in order, expansion of the order of intelligibility, as I mentioned. Yes, intelligibility, but uh, and but with, with, with the consideration that intelligibility doesn't simply mean. Um, accumulating empirical facts about the world in which we live, but intelligibility is in the proper philosophical sense. So we have ethical intelligibilities, we have cognitive intelligibilities, we have empirical intelligibility, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. practical, theoretical, so on and so forth. But uh, how, how, does function, <clears throat> how does functionality combines itself, uh, how does it combine itself with uh, with these dialectical open end roots, because I mean, as I see the dialectical procedure and uh, and uh, any object like like a pen or like any object in dialectical um, cycle, is that it cannot be somehow cut off from the um, cognitive or practical procedures in which it was somehow ingressed. And yes. um, so uh, that's why I'm saying when you when we try to provide certain kind of signification, like a master signifier for this. Uh, so structuralism deals with this in Saussurian and post Saussurian sense, like let's make it more creative. Let's call the pen the cat or uh, uh, the pen the crayon. And let, let, let's then uh, totally just um, how to say, toss this around, uh, then post-structuralists come and they say, oh, the plane of uh, things is uh, separate, the plane of signifier separate, and then the whole this, um, I mean, revolutionary and anarchic work starts. But uh, I'm talking about a little bit different thing. Mm, uh, uh, if, if we inscribe this object into the whole history, the whole diachronics of culture, of labor, of signification, of life, uh, then um, uh, how can we functionalize it um, 
uh, in terms of activity, in terms of act. Right, right, right. And, okay. uh, and of course, we can do it formally, we can formalize it. But on the other hand, if we are just crazy dialecticians, then we wouldn't be able to do it. Yes, I think that I, I would say that if, for example, when it comes to this pen, uh, if uh, uh, we are trying to do. I think. I think both uh, of those are pathological. Uh, <laughs> formalizing the span, right, uh, and also saying that oh, it has a very, very long cultural history, right, where it came from and stuff. Um, well, uh, I would say that uh, when uh, obvi obviously we all know, uh, basically excessive formalization uh, of what this pen is or means in any sort of context, why it always backfires, why right? it's just way too uh, abstracted. It's not even bracketed in a, in a, in a good sense, right? Of course, we can, we can use formal languages to describe some of its properties and how this pen can be, for example, be, having certain kinds of use values, we can formalize all of that stuff. But I would say that, that, so that, that formalization, I usually think is a scarecrow. What is scarecrow. the actual, a scarecrow? Oh. Yes, it's a boogeyman, it's a boogeyman. What I think that the real danger is, is when we think simply, when we say that this thing has such a deep origin, is more complex than what you think, namely a pen, that's when we are doing a sloppy job at philosophy. No, I'm not saying this. No, 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 I'm not, no, I'm not, I, I, no, no, absolutely, my apologies if you, if it yeah. came as if that I am, no, I'm saying that, for example, I, I, I didn't want name names, but I'm, okay, now to clear the fog, I mean, uh, no, for example, in certain, certain kind of post-humanist uh, agendas, comparative literature, post-humanism and stuff, that there is always a certain kind of appeal for something being always ever more complex, right? That, you know, okay, so this is, yes, it has a, a rich historical thing. It's a Rotring pen. Well, Rotring, um, you know, it's famous. It, a bunch of them were collaborators with Nazis. Then they actually managed to get out of the Nazi deal. They, became, they were always great engineer, but unfortunately this is actually a Japanese rotring pen, which is actually better than a German pen. <laughs> so, so we can always talk about this stuff, but then if we are going to always talk about say, saying that, oh, well, we cannot actually talk about this pen, then the talk of pen becomes futile. Isn't it? That, that's the whole yeah. idea of also intelligence, concepts mm -hmm. like intelligence, of course, that this is has has is culturally rich artifact. But as philosophers, we should understand that we can only unpack what counts as a pen, or in this case, a rotating pen, a step by a step, not simply by gesturalizing it. That is so it's very rich. Yes, of course, it's not rich in terms of symbol, then it would be a fetish or some kind of, I don't know, religious object and you would be sitting. Yes, but even, but even the cultural, but even the cultural individuation, but even the cultural and social individuation of this pen. Yes, I we can, we, can, we can talk about it, but we can always say that our task is that, yes, we can, we can address this. We can, we can say that, yes, it has a very rich uh, history of individuation, but uh, we, we have to unpack it step by step, simply by gesturing toward it. But if we talk about commodity, for instance, and the fetishized um, nature of commodity, then we, then we can very easily how uh, un, unwind the uh, fetishized character, the industrial backstage, uh, the but not all of it though. Can the we economic backstage? So, so then we will will we will be able to uh, connect it to the polit economy and social economy and certain kind of uh, uh, human labor socialities, and then the 
um, class sociality. So in, in this sense, no, you, we will be obliged to see the labor procedures and not simply signification procedures. This, this is what I'm trying to say. Yes, that yes, completely agree. Okay, but, but, but even, even in terms of commodity uh, fetishism, uh, can, for example, we start from the commodity aspects, the commodity uh, image of this pen? Can we really actually talk anything positively or critically about the engineering that has gone to this pen? Which by the way, is a pure piece of engineering. We cannot. And that's why I think that every sort, this is what I would say that the form of self-consciousness, the true practical form of self-consciousness should be always on multiple trajectories of unpacking yeah. of the concepts, of course, not just one. There is, for instance, a phenomenological attitude to pen or a Zen Buddhist attitude to pen. You look uh, like a hardcore phenomenology is, is in certain sense this Zen Buddhism. You are looking on the pen and you are understanding the penness of the pen, etc. But uh, on, on the other hand, you can look at it in terms of um, um, uh, industrial uh, production, use value, and then surplus value, and the situation of labor where it was produced, and certain kind of cartography of its um, uh, politeconomic production. And this will also be interesting. But do you agree that even then we can't actually talk exhaustively about what this pen is, right? Precisely because. Heideggerian Why is that? Of course, we, in Heideggerian sense, we will not be able to define. Yes, but but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't ever talk about this because this is exactly we can we can replace the name of this pen with language, right? So, why? I don't understand this. Why? Precisely because what goes into this pen is exactly what goes into language, and mm -hmm. if we say that it is too complex. They're coming from all these kinds of varieties of dimensions. Mm -hmm. We can never actually talk about anything. Everything become ineffable in the romantic sense that I was talking about. Yes. So Husserl's bracketing, I think, was a fundamentally enlightened, politically conscious, and philosophically robust attitude. Of course, because- We bracket, he... and then we talk. Yes, he bracketed it as transcendental operation and observing your own transcendental contemplation. Yes. And then we we see this object and this had a tremendous effect on art and uh, on, on thought and everything. I, I agree with this. Uh, but on the other hand, what I wanted somehow to describe here is this um, um, characterization of the non-self because uh, computation, for instance, it, it has to deal with the selves. It has to deal with certain kind of discrete components or discrete units. And my question is, what if we deal with indiscrete units? And if, okay, we need computation for this discrete operation and there is necessity in these discreetly organized operations, but then maybe we cannot claim that computation should arrogantly uh, pretend that it can encompass certain kind of indiscreet process, because this is what I'm asking you. You mean continuous, con continuous processes? Uh, continuous processes, yes. Temporality is also very important because, for instance, before Berardi's um, uh, article is about impossibility to emulate consciousness because consciousness is mortal and consciousness is temporal uh, uh, and uh, this is also the question how to deal with uh, 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 the necessity of the mind to be aware of its mortality and to be aware of its death the, the, this right, I, the, right. I haven't come across in your book for instance uh, the um, issue I mean, of mortality. I mean uh, okay uh, my idea about this is that uh, the, the fundamental question is, is something that is quite um, still open I used to be one of those people uh, who were uh, basically criticizing precisely this kind of obsession with discre with, with discrete right really oh okay uh, um, as opposed to the continuous, uh, hence mm -hmm. the digitalization mm -hmm. uh, revolution. 
But I think that, um, so when we are looking in the fundamentals uh, of uh, mathematical and computer philosophy of computation, we see that there is also a different story here. Uh, and that's uh, basically uh, what actually discrete digi or namely digital computation is in fact. Do in fact have we something called analog computation or all analog computation are by definition retroactive, retroactive historically from today's understanding of computer science are actually are understood as computation in terms of what takes place in digital computation, namely church Turing thesis about effective mm -hmm. comput computability. Now, now, of course, this is, these, are, these are really, I think, uh, difficult issues, open, and I don't think that um, philosophers should pay more attention to the openness of this problem. But what I want to talk about is that I don't have firm uh, alliance to either of these camps. Um, uh, I, I see some of the problems and I have, I actually respect some of the problems posed by the two camps. But I would say that there is certain kind of um, uh, trend is uh, basically emerging in philosophy, uh, in humanities, and that's uh, basically trying to um, uh, basically put down uh, things like uh, statistics, algorithms, computation in favor of the continuous, the creative, the contingent, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, no, you I, mean Luciana Parisi and uh, uh, Luciana? Luciana, no, Luciana actually, Luciana uh, has a very healthy. Uh, mm -hmm. She, she, she has. She has a, actually, I think, a healthy attitude to some of some some of these problems. But uh, I can understand from a cultural perspective. I mean, after all this uh, kind of pop. Uh, sci, pop computer sci about AI, AGI and stuff uh, being published on less wrong, all sorts of um, like some, you know, ion or no, not ion, ion is usually on the others on the other camp or, or some of these uh, places. Uh, there is a, there is a certain kinds of over optimism about um, the power of uh, digital turn algorithm and uh, basically the discretization project, right? Mm -hmm. Which actually, again, as I said, it's, it's quite misguided precisely because they don't even actually uh, address the fundamental questions of computation. I mean, one of, uh, I mean, there are, there are of course great philosophers from Pittsburgh school uh, who have been working recently on these issues. On the other camp, the problem is like this, that, uh, you know, for example, great friend, I mentioned this in another talk, Hugh Hoy, uh, idea of uh, that, you know, the statistics, that the statistics is always about more probable. So uh, what you don't get, essentially creates a sort of, sort of paradigm of thinking about the future, which is always about more probable, which, mm -hmm creates a certain kind of cultural parochialism in thought, right? Um, because it, it kind of blocks the thought of that which is less probable or least probable, namely the contingents. But I think that that's just weak argument. Why? Precisely because uh, when we are talking about this kind of scenario, we are talking about the epistemic statistics epistemological statistics, namely that what is actually a statistics really at, at the level of epistemological statistics? It's about nomological expectancy. So such that we can actually find out what a law is, what a pattern is, right? Mm -hmm. And by extension, it also implies what cannot be a natural law, right? So from an epistemological perspective, 
But mm -hmm. Yuk tries to um, put two fundamentally discussions about the statistics, bunch them together. One, the idea of contingency. And recursive. As a metaphysical, as a metaphysical register, mm -hmm. and then a statistics as an epistemological register. Mm -hmm. But if, if contingency cannot be understood in terms of laws of nature, then it is precisely metaphysical. And hence, it is actually a weak argument against the statistics. You know, I can talk about unicorns for that matter. You know, unicorns popping up, up in my drink. Okay. Um, epistemologically, it's a weak argument, but culturally and politically. Culturally and politically, but then, but then we have to coordinate it with the epistemological one, right? We, we have yes. to make a case for it, culturally and politically. Yes, absolutely so. Yes, I think that this whole idea that, I think that the great, as, as you said, the, the culturally and politically, I think the great weight, you shouldn't actually talk about statistics in that sense. You should, uh, would have said that, you know, why is it that we are always thinking about future in terms of what, what is more probable? Oh, I think because- In, in, I, a, in a very political context. I think because it's part of political futurology and also a critique of the Western uh, colonial history of Western philosophy. Right, but, but isn't it also- uh, and, and I think that Yuke's um, uh, idea and Luciana's idea very much intersect here in terms of well, I, I, I rather disagree with their attitude in, in terms of like, we deal with the compute, we deal with computation, but it's not computation, computation. It's some kind of absolutely unimaginable computation, which is not quite computation, but it has what computation never had. Never but, had, yes, yes. Yeah, but also it should not have what philosophy ever had because philosophy was the Western colonial, uh, this and this and this. So um, yeah, it remains in some kind of empty, vacuous room because it doesn't have the uh, yes. back, background of the um, classical philosophy in terms of instruments, but it also doesn't have the... Um, technical background and it relies on something that is not by definition computed. For instance, um, uh, all the, um, some, some kind of futurological ideas um, in, in what I hear from new texts of Luciana, which is constantly, by the way, quoting Yuk Hui, is that uh, we do not want functional computation. We do not want uh, Turing machine and its. Uh, then what do you want? What uh, kind of computers we don't want, are we talking Turing, about? Yes, we don't want Turing machine in computing because it's very unilateral. Because it's a capitalist machine of. Um, this is of this what uh, um, uh, who's, who's, uh, uh, Nikita. Who's so, that guy um, who, who wrote the? the let book me finish. About computation? Read, Please, read, my apologies. My apologies. <laughs> Just, I will be finishing. And then uh, what is really interesting uh, that uh, you have to inscribe into this logic everything uh, that is counter um, uh, computation in, in terms of bringing into automation ethical uh, choice, will, poesis, and crash all the recursivities. And then you have to mm -hmm. claim. I bring such recursivity, which is not quite recursive. I bring such input and output, which is not the input and output, but some kind of incomputed, some kind of crashed input and output. But nevertheless, it has to remain computation, which is different from non-computation. So it's a little bit um, a crazy mixture of uh, post-Delosian um, uh, ideas. Yes and some kind of post-colonial ideas. But you know what is dangerous? Uh, that the recent conversation with Yuk was with the extreme right-wing Russian critique of Western philosophy, which is saying precisely this, that we need 
like uh, the idea of yuk is we need multi pluriversal cosmotechnics. Yes, you see, Instead that's the whole of, point of that I'm really but, afraid of when it comes to these kinds of stuff. Yes, but then uh, this right wing Russian guy also says we don't want this Western philosophy because it was too universal. It was unifying certain languages and then it was subjecting us different cultures to absolute unification. So we need some kind of um, particularizing uh, machinism and we, we need a new machine which will be a creative machine a creative uh, uh, neo-recursivity but then uh, uh, this right-wing logic of pluriversal uh, axiomatic yes. Yes. coincides with uh, cosmotechnics and this is a great problem of course yes I, I think that this is, this is actually something that I have noticed that uh, Yes, it's, 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 isn't it uh, really that, uh, you know, um, as I mentioned, uh, the lack of crispness uh, with regard to such concepts, such as computation, such as, uh, you know, cognition, life, to think, to be human. Uh, because, um, because we might say that crispness, uh, uh, we might like the distinction between various terms of crispness, crispness in terms of discrete, crispness in terms of critical crispness, so on and so forth, bunching them together, saying that all crispness in conceptual definition of computation actually is part of the problem. Then the, the basically what the reaction to that, inevitable reaction to that would be a certain kind of creativism creativism, eruptionism, you know, eruption in the order of these kinds of logical um, new world algorithms and stuff that we get in yokes. But that, that precisely because it is, uh, it emanates from the lack of conceptual crispness around these terms, it can play politically to the hands of right-wingers, alt-right actually. That's that's really, I think, that something that we should pay attention to. This is why I advocate that, look, we can talk about the cultural um, uh, aura or the political aura of these concepts. And of course, there are so many things wrong with them, but we should also... Um, look, go back to the foundational problems as philosophers uh, around these concepts, it starts to see what actually, for example, computation is uh, and how it can be culturally assimilated, S separating as much as for now, as much as we can, these two issues apart, even though we, we know that they are now becoming, have become entangled, such that we don't make uh, overgeneralized thesis that precisely become, uh, you know, um, adopted by alt-right. I mean, first of all, uh, we have seen it uh, that, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the Kant's, Kant's greatest idea and Hegel's as well, uh, idea of philosophy was, uh, or Plato for that, um, a strive for systematization of thinking, right? And the thing is that we see actually among these new AI people in, for example, in US, like uh, with less wrong, with, uh, for example, Yudokovsky and uh, um, Eliza Yudokovsky and other kinds of people. They say that, look, we can do the job of philosophers better than them. Mm -hmm. Because we, because we know the algorithm, right? So there is that, that kind of scenario, you know, kind of a fundamental anti-philosophical attitude toward the question of intelligence. And then also you get these kinds of really wacky Russian, the United, you know, people, <laughs> which, which basically say that, yes, this is, we are going all wrong. Uh, Let's bring back some creativity. But what they, they, their version of creativity is not the concept of nature. Mm, mm. 
we have some <clears throat> 10 minutes left, I guess, and we have some questions actually, mm -hmm. I think quite in line with, with what we're discussing right now as about the futures that are constructed with the current images of artificial intelligence. So Avram uh, asks um, if he didn't get it wrong, Reza was criticizing the quotient of the future with probability, then what other terms uh, than probability could we use uh, and what would AGI teach us about that? Um, that's a question for both of you. I will say that this comes back to the idea of um, probability. Probability or a statistic in that sense, uh, I would say that always inevitably has uh, a, an, epistemic, an epistemic register, an epistemic meaning, right? This is why we are talking about laws in terms of the statistics, right? Patterns in terms of the statistical patternings and stuff. Uh, I would say that in, in a better word to talk about a future that we have not yet conceived or likely we didn't conceive for a reason because of the kind of actions that we historically took shouldn't be actually based on the notion of probability or statistic. It should be on the notion of possibility mm. of different worlds, counterfactual worlds, right? Uh, like, and that's that's a different that's a, that's a that's a different story. Like, um, it's the idea of um, everything that we have ever cognized, right, including the notion of our, ourselves in the world, can be recognized anew, and that recognition, recognizing the act of recognizing is not a matter of probability. It's a matter of possibility and necessity. Yes, but that's very different from, uh, for instance, Luciana's uh, interpretation, because for her, uh, the main thing is prehension and preemptive element. So what is interesting for her that these loops of outcomes, which are not inscribed in input, and this is what she calls incomputable, they are producing the future that never existed in the past and, and that is not connected with any past whatsoever. And that's why this absolutely um, open up um, astronautic future is free from the yes. essentialisms of the past, etc. Right. And uh, 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 on, on the one hand, it's a very fresh idea. On the other hand, uh, I mean, it, it's not doable, I think, because the subjectivity of this future is, is very, very suspicious. Um, this, is, this is one of the things, I mean, uh, um, a friend of mine that uh, you might know, uh, I was talking just uh, before this talk, uh, Jason Babak Mohaqeq, um, um, he, was, he was saying that he's really interested lately in this idea of, uh, uh, potential selves, right? That uh, there is this kind of like uh, Middle Eastern form of thinking, but also Asian. Uh, mm -hmm. That um, uh, what we call a self, a self, is just um, is the most parochial of all selves, right? Precisely because it has forgotten that it could be something otherwise. Mm -hmm. So essentially, there is this kind of mystic form of thinking uh, that tries to erase the past, namely the determination of this existing past, such that it paves the road for those other selves mm -hmm. that had potential to come back, to emerge. But the thing is that I would say that maybe in mysticism, it actually works as an exciting idea. But in terms of politics and cognition, it doesn't. Because any sort, as Nelson Goodman says, any sort of uh, um, alternative, any sort of future that we are going to talk about should always be and can always be by necessity be recomposed from the existing world and not this existing world and mm. not another world. Yeah, this would be Ilyankovian also because he was insisting that there is only the world that exists. You cannot fantasize. So the phantasmatic idea would be the bubble. And uh, um, very often 
you come across this in computer sci-fi things like the the new bubbles might be new options and new contingencies and new right. worlds right and it's it, it's so fascinating to imagine this new intersections of new unimaginary bubbles it's it's also very very yeah it's it's very refreshing in a way but what I would like to ask you, um, uh, the two questions maybe, when you mention in your book um, um, causality and you claim that computing is able, uh, is, has the ability and capacity for causality, whereas in some other texts on computation, I came across the idea that uh, algorithmic design deals with correlation but it has difficulties with causation uh, as well as volition. Like, do we need volition and causation for concept creation? And if computing doesn't have this volition and causation- Logical causality or, did, or, or uh, I mean, so there are two ones, one which is called- okay, Sebastian okay, yeah, Please explain, yeah. Logical causation, logical causation in the sense that, for example, um, you know, certain kinds of premises lead to certain kinds of logical premise, logical premises logically mm -hmm. yield certain kinds of logical consequences. So that's, it's a kind of what we might call to be a logical explanation, lo not a causal explanation, right? Then there is another one, um, causality in a, you know, scientific idea of causality. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think that um, computation can explain the nature of causality, right? Mm -hmm. Com computation is essentially what causality is in, in that sense, in, in okay. that determinism. So you're sense, saying right? that it, it, it exists in the, it exerts the procedure of causality, okay. Yes, essentially what, what we are, nomological expectancies, mm -hmm. uh, in, to use uh, Hempel's work word, uh, for example, that certain kinds of uh, pieces fall uh, um, uh, together, certain kinds of events will happen under a bracket or a set or a tuple of conditions one, conditions two, conditions three, conditions four, so on and so forth. As long as we have these conditions, as, we ha as long as we have actually uh, basically um, put together the sets of, um, uh, you know, uh, these preconditions and uh, what follows from them under those conditions, then we have something close to a pattern. A pattern. Yes, okay, okay. Um, yeah, and maybe my, my last um, um, question would be, or rather, one of the disagreements that I have, despite many agreements with you, um, is this ineffability, this condition of the ineffable. And you know how important the condition of the ineffable was for post-structuralist thought. And I was trained by this thought, you know, just... I, I, me too, me too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Levinasian, Deridian, Deleuzean, etc. And the ineffable is not simply um, the non-said or non-comprehended, non but it is sometimes uh, uh, deliberately ineffable in terms of... Uh, Dynamicity. Dynamicity. Uh, in terms of slowing, in, in terms of slowing the procedure to find the specific complexities, and I I very much re, re, um, rely here on how, for instance, Derrida tries to translate rationality of cogito into insanity, and he does this into virtuoso way in in his article, which is called "Cogito as the Problem of Insanity." I haven't read that. I haven't read that. Yeah, you have to read that Cogito as the problem of insanity. And he is arguing with Michel Foucault because you know the idea of Michel Foucault that, oh, these rationalities were suppressing the insanity. All but, but, but Foucault himself was a socialist rationalist. <laughs> yes, yes. But I'm, I'm telling that he was uh, 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 pro providing this archaeology, this historical archaeology. Right. 
of heterotopia. And then Derrida is arguing with him saying that if you want to find insanity, there is nothing more insane than cogito itself. And he proves it on, on, the, on an article for 50 pages. And then Foucault never talked to him because he was so pissed off after this. <laughs> so, uh, this, um, so this. I is think uh, with, with regard to ineffability, this is something that a friend of mine has been telling me um, that, yes, I, I, I think that uh, there, there, are this certain, there is a certain kind of ineffability that we have in the history of philosophy, and it's a respectable thesis. Um, he wasn't actually, uh, he, he tried to uh, put it in uh, terms that I can actually understand it as, you know, as someone who has a little bit knowledge of applied mathematics and dynamic systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, he told me that, you see, uh, for example, uh, there is one ineffability in the, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the phenomenon under question is just fully epistemologically opaque, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that we can never actually say anything about it, right? Mm -hmm. Then there is, then there is another one, which is a weaker version of this, that we cannot exhaust, exhaust the characterization of the essence at work. Of, the, of, of such phenomena, right? Then there is a third one, which is, which he called the uh, the respectable version. But when, for example, there is a system uh, whose um, which which we can we always talk about it, right? You know, we can we can give actually models about this, and these models work. But there is also the component of ineffability, precisely because the system. The, co the, tra the transcendental co-constitution is open. Mm. The, mm -hmm. Meaning that the dynamicity of the system always uh, going one step further than the transcendental co-constitution, such that, that even though we can talk about this, but every time that we are talking about it, the transcendental co-constitution should be elevated to a different level. Mm -hmm. yes. Reinvented anew. Yeah. I guess we'll have to be wrapping up soon. I wonder if we have some final questions from the audience, maybe. Um, and anyway, thank you greatly for this conversation and. Thank I you, really Katie. enjoyed it. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Nikita. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you absolutely. Thank you, it, it was, was a magnificent pleasure. to talk to you. Yes, it was a pleasure. It was great. I learned a lot. So <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I will definitely also check uh, uh, these two uh, activity and consciousness and the, the Derrida text. Definitely. So. Okay. Что прощаемся? Yeah. Before <laughs> before we end the talk, uh, I will. Uh, uh, I'll be happy to introduce the next episode of Shelter and Places that will take place on December 1st, and it is going to be a discussion with uh, Athena Kurtzajani and uh, Kalina Patalis, moderated by Mohamed Salami, um, and they will discuss the historical dialectic between the Greek elites and Zaytis about destabilizing the Ottomans' imperial infrastructure and the mass movement for national liberation, uh, liberation preceded by the force of enlightenment. So, I'm pretty sure it's going to be captivating as well. Sounds great. And thank you once again for thank you. our Ciao. captivating. Uh, Kelly, do I have your email? Uh, no, Nikita? I, I, I uh, how, uh, how can I write I'll you? I'll share those. Yeah. Yes, uh, I, uh, I, I will write Nikita, and we shall share. Okay, absolutely, sure. absolutely, okay, absolutely. So in touch, in touch. Love to you all. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye bye. Bye bye.